Dr. Christy Panagekis. That was good. That was correct. All right. She works at the United Way of Buffalo and Erie County, and she is the Director of Research and Public Policy. Her work includes analyzing community needs and the impact of the United Way's work, in addition to conducting legislative advocacy. She earned a PhD in sociology from UB in 2015. Welcome and for joining us. Um, prior to United Way in 2017, she worked as a project director at the Research Institute on Addictions, where she studied the relationship between drug and alcohol use and sexual assault for lesbian and bisexual women. She's also conducted research for, at Roswell Park Cancer Center, um, and she's also and she also worked with Elderwood, and she's got a marvelous background. Um, her hobbies include traveling, watching live music, but these days that's been limited to watching everything on her DVR and hanging out with her husband at home. So thanks for joining us, Christy. And we have with us Jeremy, Jeremy Besh. Uh, Jerry has been the head of the Park School at Buffalo and Amherst since 2018. He joined Park in 2003 as an English teacher, and he has served in various administrative positions, including Dean of Students, Head of Upper School, and Assistant Head of School. He's a native Buffalonian, raised in the Uni University Heights neighborhood. He loves working at Park as Buffalo rediscovers itself and pushes through its renaissance that in many ways matches Park's longstanding practices and philosophy. He has a master in executive leadership and change from Damon and a bachelor's in English from Canisius. His professional experience spans both private and independent schools and includes administration, classroom teaching, curriculum development, teacher development, and evaluation, student advisement, and coaching. Damon recognized Jeremy with an Executive Leadership Alumnus of Distinction Award in 2019. He's also a regular volunteer speaker for Leadership Buffalo on our Diversity Day. Him and his wife, um, Rebecca, are graduates of the 2018 Experience Buffalo Program, and his son, Calvin, just recently graduated from the Youth Leadership Program. And then we have with us Sherry Mooney, and Sherry is the President and CEO of Mind Squad Consulting, LLC. Following a near 20 career as partner and trial attorney at a New York top 100 law firm, Sherry entered the corporate world and worked as vice president of business development for Western New York's largest healthcare system during its affiliation with six separate hospitals. She was a chief administrative officer for a rapidly growing medical group of 40 plus general and specialty practices and senior vice president for a top 40 US bank providing oversight on all governmental and corporate relations. She has served in various capacities on the board of directors of Every Woman Opportunity Center, where she was president, the Western New York chapter of the Women's Bar Association, where she was also president, the Buffalo Center for Arts and Technology, we know it as VCAT, founding director and officer, and Western New York Workforce Investment Board and the Humpton Woodward Institute. She's originally from St. Catharines, Ontario. I have been meaning to ask you that. <laughs> Now that I know, Sherry has, has called Western New York home for over 20 years, and she resides in Orchard Park with her husband, daughter, and their golden retriever, Finn. So we all have to mention our families these days. We're yeah. spending a lot of time with them. So thank you, folks. And we're going to start with um, Christy, and she's going to do a, a presentation for us to begin. Great. Thank you, Althea. So I'm going to share my screen. I find I'm very tech savvy when no one's looking, and then as soon as people are watching, all bets are off. So cross your fingers that I do this right. Okay, could I get, everyone can see my screen, right? Perfect, thank you so much. All right, so I am going to be talking to you today, thinking about need more generally. And so first I wanted to start with, you know, a lot of you have probably seen this image in the news. This is from the San Antonio Food Banks, right when the COVID crisis first started, it's maybe two to three months ago now. And so we're seeing a lot of images of need right now, but I think something that we don't often think about is who are the people who comprise this need? You know, what does, when we talk about people who are in need, people who are struggling, what does that mean? So you might look at this image and you might think you know who this population is, these people who are, who are waiting to get help from this food bank. But my experience with the United Way is that that's not always necessarily true. And so what I'm here to share with you about is a concept called ALICE. So ALICE stands for Asset Limited, Income Constrained, and Employed. But to be honest with you, when I first came to United Way and they taught me this, I thought, great, but what does that actually mean in real people words? What does it mean to be ALICE? And so the way I tend to think about ALICE is it just means families who are living above the poverty line but are still struggling to make ends meet. And so the way I talk about ALICE is I often think about it as both a population and a tool. So I'll start with the population and then I'll talk about how we use it as a tool as the United Way. So 
typically when we think about need, when you hear people talk about need, they often talk about the poverty line. And so we think about, well, people who are in need are people who are living in poverty. And so Alice helps us understand that there are more people than just those who are living below the poverty line who are struggling financially, who are looking for additional help. And so this comes into the benefit of Alice as a tool for us as the United Way, because I'm not going to get into this too much, you know, but normally when I do my full Alice presentation, I talk a lot about why do we need a tool like Alice? And most simply, what I'm just going to share with you today is that we need it because the poverty line statistic is artificially low. It's based on a study that came out in 1955 and has not been updated since the late 1960s. So the way that families spend money, the, the cost of you know, necessary expenses has changed in 50 years. So most simply, the poverty line isn't really the most accurate way for us to capture need. And so that's where Alice as a tool becomes really helpful for us as the United Way. Because it's something you know we were able to always talk about anecdotally. We knew that more people were struggling than what the poverty line would show us. But now Alice actually offers us empirical data to put behind that, to be able to demonstrate the scope of need. Something, this is a little wonky, but I, I anticipated a question, so I wanted to explain this now. What happens with Alice and this data is it draws from census data. And so census data always takes two years to come out and be publicly available. So it's always going to lag by two years. We are actually, I thought I was going to get it this week and I could share it with you today, and unfortunately I didn't. We are right on the verge of getting the most up-to-date Alice data, but that would be 2018 data. So something I want you to think about when you look at these numbers is that these are numbers from two years ago. So just knowing what the last three months look like, I feel very comfortable telling you that there is actually even more need in Erie County than what I'm going to be showing you today. So just so you had some level set about how to think about this data. So first, when we think about where, who is Alice, how much do we have in our community, I'm going to talk at the level of Erie County specifically. So when we think about the federal poverty line, we know that in Erie County, 14% of households live below the federal poverty line. But then when you add in this Alice information, what you're going to learn is that almost twice as many households are considered Alice, 27%. So when you put that all together, what you're going to find is that actually 41% of households in Erie County are experiencing financial hardship of some sort. And just to explain, when I use the term financial hardship, that is poverty plus Alice. That is all of this scope of need. And so you think about what I told you a moment ago, that if we just look at the poverty line, that doesn't adequately capture the actual volume of need in our community. So this is again why Alice is such a benefit as a tool, because it helps us reveal this population that might be hidden to many people otherwise. So also just another way to demonstrate the scope is I want to talk about where do we find Alice in Erie County. So first, when you're looking at this chart, this is a map of townships in Erie County. The most important thing to know is that the darker the color yellow, the higher the prevalence. So this right now is looking at people living below the poverty line, households below the poverty line. And if you look at it, it looks like kind of what you would expect. You, would, you see darker yellow in the city of Buffalo, in the city of Lackawanna. You also see it in the Cattaraugus Reservation. So that seems like, okay, that's intuitive to me. But then when you look at this map that shows you the population that's Alice, what it's going to show you is there's actually a lot more need than what you would anticipate. So the same thing again when you look at this, the darker the color, the higher the prevalence. But what you start to see is there's need in places that we often don't think about. So I didn't include this in my bio, but I didn't grow up in Buffalo. I moved here to go to grad school and then stayed after I graduated. And so when I was first learning this data, I thought a lot about like, well, what's my understanding of Buffalo? You know, I think about Orchard Park, for example, you know, moving here and not growing up here, Orchard Park is where football players live. Like that's what I think of when I think of Orchard Park. But then if you look at this map, you see that 22% of households in Orchard Park are Alice. And so what this map really does is just help to illustrate the need is much more prevalent than you know, our common understandings might be. So Alice is a population that's living in every town, in every zip code, in every city. Alice is not concentrated to those places where you typically think of need living. So then from here, I want to move into thinking, showing you just a little bit again, first about how Alice improves upon the federal poverty line, but then also just very briefly, why does Alice exist? You know, why do we have this population? So you remember I told you a moment ago that the federal poverty line is artificially low. And so one of the really cool things that Alice does is it's able to build upon that because it looks more, it takes a more detailed look, excuse me, into how household budgets 
are structured. It also, if you'll notice here, considers not just the size of the household, but also the composition of the household. Because obviously it makes sense that two adults in a household are going to have very different expenses than one adult and one child, for example. So what you'll see here is I've put in these graphics to show you what the budget of the Alice household budget looks like relative to the federal poverty line. So just looking on the far left, for example, you'll see that the Alice household budget is actually $10,000 more a year than what the federal poverty line says a person needs to be financially self-sufficient. You'll see this again with the, all of the budgets across the line. And so it's really just another way to demonstrate that this is a better way for us to assess need because we're trying to take a more realistic look at what do families need in order to be you know, thriving financially. So I think, okay, good. Um, so then still looking at this screen, something else to think about is that why does Alice exist? And I have really two reasons here to show you. So first, when we look at this, these budgets, I want you to think about, you know, a lot of you, these are expenses that you're used to, you're paying for as well, but think about how expensive some of these things are. Child care, think about health care, even transportation. We know that these are really expensive but necessary household items. And so that's really difficult for families when, these are things that need to be paid for, but they just cost too much. And so that kind of tees into the second reason why Alice exists. Okay, um, the other reason is that many of the jobs in Western New York just aren't paying families enough. So what you're looking at here is a chart of the most common jobs in Western New York. So to get slightly wonky on you again, I know I've been talking about Erie County, but this data can only look at the level of Western New York. So this broadens a little bit beyond Erie County and it's going to look at, you know, the Niagara Falls metro area as well. But what you'll see when you look here, if you look at this column on the far right, it's showing you the annual salary, both in annual, excuse me, and hourly. But what that really illustrates to you is that a lot of jobs, a lot of the most common jobs just aren't paying families enough money. And keep in mind that what we're looking at here, this data assumes that people actually are even working right now. So if you look at these jobs, a lot of these are the jobs that we know people have had to step away from in the last few months because they haven't been able to do them. So when we think about why Alice exists, it's really this combination of two things. First, it's that many of the most common jobs in our area just are paying relatively low wages compared to the second part, which is you know, the high cost of really necessary household expenses. And so at this point, you know, I'm gonna skip this slide because I've run a little bit long, but I can come back to this to talk a little bit more just about the budget numbers if need be. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Jeremy, I believe is our next presenter. Thank you, Christy, that was good information. Jeremy. Yeah, thanks, Christy. Um, when we were planning this talk, uh, one of the things that left me most excited about it is the, is the ability to sort of take a, a talk that I'll share with you now um, but provide additional context to it uh, from both Christy and what we'll hear from Sherry later. Um, because I think that context is helpful in terms of understanding our role as, as leaders and why doing some of the work I'm about to share with you is really important. Um, Christy talks a lot about um, sort of critical needs, right, and critical needs assistance. Um, people need help with things that are required for regular day-to-day -day living. Um, I'm gonna frame that in a, in a term that I call access, right? And, and really access is the primary driver of everything I'm about to share with you. So I would argue that um, if we talk about ethical approaches to, uh, approaches to leadership and particularly in times of crisis, uh, like the one we're living in now, um, there are some responsibilities that we have if, if we take on the mantle of leadership. Um, and they all come back to that need to provide access either for the people who are working with us and for us or to the people we're serving through whatever job we do. So how does this all work and how does it tie to diversity work? Um, I argue that there are, are three things that any, any leader really needs to be considerate of uh, if he or she is going to be a successful leader. Uh, and those are understanding your identity uh, individually, personally, um, understanding the privileges that come with your individual identity, and then understanding how you can use those privileges to provide those you're serving access. So I wanna talk a little bit about, about that. First, um, I wanna acknowledge the fact that you're hearing about diversity work from a middle-aged white guy. All right, that's, I know that's 
a little a little strange, um, but I think it's also important in some ways. Um, I did not come to diversity work intentionally. Um, well, that's not true. I did come to diversity work intentionally, but only after coming to it by accident to start. So uh, as Althea said in the beginning, uh, I started off my career as a teacher. And I grew up in a pretty diverse neighborhood uh, in uh, North Buffalo, the University Heights neighborhood. And slowly as I moved into adulthood as a straight white male, I moved away from that diversity without even knowing it was happening. Um, my parents moved into the suburbs when I was a junior in high school. Uh, I then went to a local, um, well, I went to that, that local private high school and the no amount of diversity in my life dropped significantly. I then went to a local uh, private college. Again, the diversity dropped. It wasn't until I, I left Buffalo for a little while and went to teach at a school in Metro Detroit where I recognized that, oh my goodness, um, I'm now surrounded by a diversity of people that I haven't seen in my life for a long time. And being a teacher for those kids who were different than I was, was the thing that got me paying attention to that. So I accidentally fell into diversity work um, because of 9-11. Uh, the school I worked at had three main populations. Uh, wealthy white kids primarily, whose parents were executives in the auto industry. Um, middle working class, mostly black kids, whose parents lived in and around Pontiac, Michigan, and many of whom worked in the auto industry, but not at the executive level, uh, and many of whom worked in service industries. And then a third distinct population called Chaldean Americans. Uh, Chaldean Americans, uh, Chaldeans, are Christian Iraqis who were driven out of Iraq by Saddam Hussein while Saddam Hussein was in power. And for lots of reasons, they've congregated in southeastern Michigan um, so that there are more Chaldeans in southeastern Michigan than there are anywhere else in the world right now. 9-11 happened and our president went on TV and said that this was Iraq's fault. Now, most of the faculty at my school were white um, and none of us had had any diversity training of any kind and yet the president of the United States called out a third of our population and we had no idea what to do. So uh, my headmaster at the time and a team of us got together and we started sort of jumping into diversity work. Um, and that led me to my career. When we came back to Buffalo, that I found the Park School, which is one of the most diverse schools around Western New York by pretty much any metric. Um, and it got me on this path towards figuring out how can I best serve the diverse and different students whose experiences are wholly different in mine, than mine uh, to make sure that they have access to the things they need to be successful adults. So that was my primary driver that got me in all of this. And I was lucky enough to do a program called SEED, which was Seeking Educational Equity and Diversity. Uh, and it was based on the work of a university professor that I'll mention a little later. Uh, and um, it starts with this idea of identity, understanding who you are. Um, so all of that stuff I just told you about my path was not stuff that I'd ever thought of. It wasn't until I really started doing equity and diversity work that I did some self-examination about why were these things important to me and why have I become the person I am. Um, so I am a, a white, single, middle-aged, uh, straight male. That designation for me in our culture is pretty helpful to have. Uh, it's also to, important to note that those big four designations are not something that I had anything to do with, right? I couldn't control those things. They weren't uh, something I worked towards. It's just who I was. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little while too. Um, but in doing this self-reflection, I realized a couple of things. I realized that I had grown up with a really diverse friend base. And then as I had gotten older, had moved away from that, not with any intent, right? It just sort of happened as life happened. Um, and then I discovered when, especially when I moved to, to uh, Metro Detroit and, and outside of Pontiac, I found that I was connecting in familiar ways with the African-American students I was teaching more so than their white counterparts. And that was a weird thing for me. Uh, it wasn't something I was expected, but it led me down this path to start thinking about who I am and why. So I will posit to you that the first step for any leader uh, especially if you're thinking about leading or serving a diverse population, is that you first must know who you are. Okay, so that's step one. There's an exercise, and I'll, I'll put these in the comments when I'm done talking. There's an exercise that's kind of fun, and remember I started as an English teacher. Uh, it's called an I am from poem. And you can Google that, and you'll find all sorts of different templates for it. And the nice thing is the more you do it, 
uh, the more you'll learn about yourself. And if you do it in groups of team members or employees or students or family members, you'll also start to learn about them in a way that's really helpful for leadership. So I'm gonna recommend that if you have some time, Google I am from poems and start writing some. Uh, it's a simple prompt. It just says I am from, and then you fill in that blank with anything that makes you you. Uh, so that's item one, identity. Item two is privilege. Once you start to understand why you are the person you are, you should start to consider the privileges that come with those things. So I mentioned being white, middle-aged, uh, male, and straight, okay? Again, none of those things I have any control over. Uh, I, also, I also was lucky enough to be born to uh, a married couple who stayed married, who were living in the lower middle class. I was lucky enough to be born in a geographic region that provided me things like healthy water, uh, healthy, a healthy living situation, uh, access to good education. Um, again, none of these things are, are, are things that I did or chose to do. Um, we all have these, regardless of who you are or how you define yourself or what you believe or where you've come from. We all have things that are important parts of who we are that are just that way, okay? And I'm gonna call those things unearned privileges, okay? So as a white male, especially if I put on a suit jacket, I can walk into pretty much any meeting room and know that people are gonna pay attention to me. If you've worked in our world for any amount of time, you know that that same level of attention is not often granted to women or to people of color or to people who are dressed uh, in a way that suggests um, poverty or economic struggle. So I've learned that I can use that as, as an inroads to have conversations with people that others might not be able to have. And as a leader, and so for example, uh, as an advocate for students, uh, I can often get people to listen to me uh, about their children in ways that they might not uh, listen, they certainly won't listen to their children on their own about, or they might not listen to somebody who didn't look and sound the same way I do. Okay, those are unearned privileges. And I've discovered that I should use them in order to help those who are not given the same amount of access to things that I am, okay? Um, there are also long lists of earned privileges, okay? I don't wanna think that I'm saying everything we do or everything we achieve is unearned, right? Hard work is really important. Uh, dedication to causes is really important. Um, getting a good education, um, those, those are all, all really important and important elements of, of becoming successful but they are often paired with those unearned things um, that make achieving those goals a little bit easier sometimes, um, or depending on, on what the makeup of the identity are, they can make them a little harder, and that's where we need to help each other. Um, there's a really good article that I will also put in the comments. Um, that SEED program I mentioned before was founded by a university professor named Dr. Peggy McIntosh. And uh, she wrote an article that was foundational for me in the work I've done around diversity work. It's called Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack. And just a very quick thumbnail of that, of that article. Dr. McIntosh, uh, a white female university professor, was complaining in a break room one day to two of her colleagues about how her male colleagues weren't taking, weren't, they weren't taking her work as seriously as their own or her opinion as seriously as theirs. Her two colleagues agreed with her. They were also women. But they also pointed out that it was just the tip of the iceberg for them because they happened to be women of color. So when Dr. McIntosh asked them about what they meant by that, they talked to her about, look, you know, we're teaching, this was at Wellesley College, you know, we're teaching at um, a, a university that is in a suburban semi-rural setting outside of a major urban area, it's outside of Boston. And uh, there are things that while simple for you as a white woman are really complicated for us as black women, okay? And she lists this long list of things that live in that invisible knapsack um, that are indicators of privilege. And a couple of simple ones, we've, we've heard this a lot uh, over recent weeks, recent years, uh, as moms to black children, they had to teach their kids how to behave particularly if they were ever pulled over for law enforcement. Um, but then there's also sort of smaller, sort of more innocuous day-to-day -day things. As black women and, and moms to children with um, black hair, if they wanted to get a haircut, they had to drive into Boston to find a barber who could cut their hair. Or if one of, her, if one of their children skinned their knees, 
they had no chance of finding bandages that match their skin tone. And you can read this long list of things that she talks about that sort of I identify for us the pieces of identity uh, that we often don't even think about, but that have great impact on who we are. Um, so that's item two. Item one is learn, learn your identity. And item two is start to think about the privileges that you have that are unearned that come with that identity. And then step three is the most important one. How do you use those privileges to be a better ally? And again, like I said at the beginning, I'm gonna define being a better ally by providing access, okay? Either to those you employ or to those you're serving in the work that you do. Um, as Christie's work indicated, it is not often easy to see where people are coming from or what their backgrounds are or what particular problems they may be struggling with, right? The indicators that we think we have that give us what we think is an honest picture of that are not always good indicators and the picture is not always honest. So as leaders, we need to consider all of the things I just talked about as a means of getting to know those we're working with or serving and then figure out ways that we can have them have the same access to those things we care about that we do. And those three things together really speak to ethical leadership, particularly in a time like we're living right now. Um, well, the thing I'll leave us with is right now, as much strife and racial tension and deserved change we seem to be living through in the moment, this is a really good leadership lesson. And it's demonstrable of the fact that the leadership in our country, regardless of your political bend, is not serving its people, right? Clearly, we have a level of leadership that has not heard what it needed to hear for decades now. So it's important to recognize in your leadership that there will be signs and signals and things that are, are, are coming across your radar that you might not be paying attention to. But if you do that introspective work and you get to know yourself a little bit and you start to think about how that, those pieces of your identity inform who you are and what you have access to, you can then start providing that access to others. And I'd say that's a central part of the ethical leadership conversation we're having. Thank you, Jeremy. And you pulled that together nicely. So um, we're going to turn this over to Sherry now, and she's going to even pull it together even more. So you're probably all wondering, what does this have to do with each other? But yeah. it's coming around. <laughs> well, you know, it all has to do with it. It's all integrated. Thanks, Althea. Um, you know, these two certainly raised the bar. I was really excited to see um, how Christy put it together. I remember working on that, those issues with Every Woman Opportunity and uh, sustainability dating way back. Um, and what's interesting too is I'm seeing some people from that are here from my days when uh, we were starting out charter schools and all the issues that we had back then and um, some of the community investment efforts that we did with big banking those people are here too so that's exciting but you know we're in an unprecedented time with this pandemic that goes without saying and there's more professional and personal demands put on um, people um, and that Alice population if you take any like just any drive-by on COVID-19, you are going to see the significant impacts of unemployment in those populations. And those populations are heavily populated with people of color. Um, when we're talking about unemployment, uh, unavailability of sick leave, childcare leave, um, the impact is, I would say, devastating on those communities. Um, and when we're looking through how businesses and leaders should act and react, I don't think we can take a blind eye um, and say, well, you know, we're all here, we're all having a hard time. It is different, okay? There are statistical, there's tons of data. Well, we could go through it for, you know, an entire week. But the key is, is that um, that further complicates how other people's lives are versus some of us who, as Jeremy's pointed out, have some unearned or even earned privileges, right? Um, and we need to consider that in our decision making. And so, you know, we've got a changed environment. Many people, uh, if they do actually have jobs, they're at home, they have a changed work environment. Their coworkers are now really family and friends who, or um, roommates who've been displaced um, and, uh, or they're coming from deserted offices. There's no real social connection. And businesses and employees are starting to balance concerns, right? And sometimes they're almost diametrically opposed. If you think about how we start in business when we come to work, right? you know, we're on the clock. We're not expected to engage in other employment, childcare, 
volunteering for not for profits, you know, you're there to do work, you know, you're not supposed to be on managing your stock portfolio or using work resources for improper purposes. But now we have a pandemic. And so businesses need to lighten up. Certainly government regulations have lightened up on businesses, right? So corporations need to um, use the benefits of looser regulations to also loosen up some of the expectations of employees. And that certainly happened um, in many instances, but in others it hasn't. Um, and also, of course, we've got a lot of fears in business about you know, what the outcomes are. People are under a lot of stress. Don't kid yourself. Um, I get a lot of calls from businesses about managers handling stress because they have to do a lot more check-ins than they had to before. They weren't trained for this. What do they do? Uh, managerial burnout is probably right now, in my opinion, as bad as the old days of physician burnout. Physician and healthcare worker burnout, of course, is now just skyrocketed. But suffice to say, um, there's a lot of pressure on management as well. And sometimes they're not really handling it as well as we would like um, as business owners. So, you know, um, there's resources out there. I encourage people to use them, specifically EAP resources have been very helpful for a lot of my clients. Um, but now we're starting to phase in. And as we're phasing in, we just have this Alice data here that's telling us pretty much 41% of at least the Erie County workforce is experienced significant financial hardship, okay? These are people that I guess we used to refer to as the working poor, um, and now we have a really much better term, which is Alice. Um, and they are gonna be facing a lot more struggles than we know. And I think that as they're coming in, those are conversations that we need to have. I know you guys are gonna be doing some difficult conversation um, uh, town halls in the future, and I think that's really important. Um, you know, we also are coming closer to people in privacy issues, um, not just data collection, and physical examinations, and the usual things you talk about in the ER con in the HR context, but um, people are getting closer to people because they're in their homes, and now they're seeing things, and you may see something in the background that you weren't supposed to see. Maybe somebody's husband is wearing a yarmulke, or somebody is a member of the LGBTQ population, or maybe you're finding out um, information about someone's health care. There's a whole bunch of, you know, pill bottles in the back. And people are anxious. A lot of people are out of work. They're concerned. So they're not really caring as much about how you run the perfect Zoom conference or do I have my ring light up, okay? Um, they're trying to um, get their kids schooled. They're trying to get their husband to keep their job. Um, they're trying to get their neighbor um, not to send their kids over without masks. There's a lot of different issues. And so you are going to, as leaders, managers, as coworkers, you're gonna come into a lot of private information on people. And my single biggest concern is how that information is going to be used in the future. Because you have loosened restrictions, you have people in an anxious and panic mode, and you are now learning things that they probably didn't want you to know and are concerned. And when they move past this and we get back in, they're gonna know. So the question is, ethically, what can you use and what can't you, right? So a lot of corporations are getting out in front of it and trying to develop very good corporate socio um, profiles, right? You know, I know Facebook and HSBC gave out $1,000 to every one of their employees that, you know, was making a certain level. Um, car insurance companies are giving us refunds. We have elderly hours at grocery stores. Uh, not that they're reducing their prices, I'll add that. Um, we're starting to see corporations, some, act with more of a stakeholder mindset versus a shareholder mindset. And that's, that's good. That's very critical, right? But then we also have some bad ambassadors out there. And the employees that are being phased back in um, are, um, have been subject to people who have been profiteering from a crisis, from one way or the other, misleading claims about how products use, you know, do I vax, do I not vax, political issues. You've got people who are inflating prices, preying on consumers um, because they're acting out of fear and anxiety. Um, these, are, these are tough things because remember most people, um, even in the upper Alice, and I think Christy would say this, I think even in that population, they still took for granted a bit of a basic, basic needs. And now we have people fighting over toilet paper and yeast and different things that 
um, other people have tended to consume in huge amounts, justifying it based on being prepared. And then we have other parts of the population who are now facing a lack of consumption. And so that's another way that people have been preyed upon in, um, at every level, um, because we did, we, there was a shock. There was a shock there, even for people who um, were um, in the Alice population, they're, they're, they're shocked as well. They, how do I get this? How can I not get this? What do you mean toilet paper is not? I, I got to stand in line for that? So not only are consumers learn, not only are corporations learning that we're much more interconnected than we thought, consumers and people who work for you are also learning that we're interconnected in terms of the impact of product and brand choices, right? And we need to think about being conscious of the choices of who we want to be with. What are the companies? Who are the people who are making responsible decisions? Being a responsible corporation when it comes to consumption, you don't need to have 80 pallets of hand sanitizer if you're down to 25% of your manufacturing capacity and you only have 30 workers there. You don't need that, right? And so, um, these are, are some of the things that we need to have our business leaders really consider. Hospitals had to do it right from the beginning. We have this amount of um, ventilators, this amount of protective gear. Who's going to get what? Which patients do we choose? How are we going to make those decisions? Corporations are going to be in that position too, especially as we phase back um, our workplace. Now, the other piece that's going to be an issue for leaders uh, with ethics is that now we've been acting pretty much out of a primary concern for health and safety. And there are differing opinions on exactly how much the economy is being devastated. Clearly, you know, for every 10 jobs, I guess, lost, three jobs are created. So some people are actually benefiting from um, what's happened, but most people aren't. Um, and it's healthcare now sort of versus economy and we're moving into that. And people have very, very strong opinions. They're very anxious and they're very concerned. And so as we adapt to this new normal, um, we're also, it, corporations sometimes will have, and this is business, small or big or small, you're going to have an opportunity to conduct physical examinations of employees that you never would have done before, all in the name of health and safety. Some people are going to do contact tracing. You're gonna have information on where your clients, I mean, where your employees are going, what they're doing. This is private information. You're collecting data. How is that gonna be shared? Do they know? Have they agreed to it? Should they agree to it? Um, there's a lot of issues that are gonna come up between the individual freedom to choose and versus the health and safety of the workplace. Um, and we really need to be careful that we don't start accumulating data for our own internal needs as companies uh, and employers or as corporations for commercial purposes um, when people haven't really individually signed on and they don't have the time to think about, wait a second, maybe I should be opting out on this because of X, Y, and Z. Um, also, there's also ethical considerations when we're thinking about um, corporations, businesses, small, I mean, and this is LLCs, I'm an LLC, same thing. When we're thinking about how we act and react with our communities, okay? So we're not in a vacuum when we operate with our decisions and it's not just about consumption. But as a stakeholder, how can we work to continue to keep a better society by acting with government agencies? Um, they're gonna be coming in, they've loosened their restrictions, they are supposedly going to be giving us a lot more latitude about the th decisions we made during that time period. Well, let's not create um, further problems by being bad actors during this time and then forcing them to have to come in and, and make tougher decisions on what we did. Let's try and rise above that and understand that we really need to consider um, how we can reach out and we can coordinate with some of these entities to ensure that our employees are being taken care of. So I know it was a little bit more of an employee employer standpoint. I mean, that's where I, I come from. I, I have a lot of more of administrative and advocacy experience as an attorney, but I think that these are a lot of issues that are on employee minds and we need to really keep them into uh, consideration. So 
Um, with you. that, I'm going to turn it over, Althea. I don't know if we have questions or anyone you know, wants to add something. You know, when you when you think about uh, what you just talked about, it's um, from the employer perspective, but all the people in the Alice population and the um, less privileged, I think I would say, are employees. So it's it's important, I think, is everybody's so stressed right now. Like you said, they're not thinking through everything. So um, one of the questions that we have here is, um, what are some companies, some examples of companies or organizations, if any of you know this, um, that are doing this correctly, that are actually managing their ethical leadership um, the way as it should be? All my clients. <laughs> You're making them. <laughs> That's good. Um, you know, it's so difficult because there's a lot of data all over the place and you never really know. Um, I don't think the awards really mean much to me when I'm starting to look at that. Um, but I, I think you get a sense of who's doing the right thing by sharing stories and sharing stories between people um, who may not be in your um, circumstance. Like Jeremy said, he was um, not by design, but removed from a population that obviously um, would be facing more of a social, you know, um, and economic uh, devastating impact right now that he wouldn't be part of now, but would have been later. And so I think it behooves us to actually ask those questions about who are good companies to the people who are actually part of the Alice population. Who has been treating you well? Who hasn't been treating you well? And why? And ask that question. And you know what? And then stop. Don't opine. Listen. And then when you stop listening, do what I call deep listen and start listening even further and let them talk and ask them why. I think that that's probably the best thing out there to find out about these, these companies. Because again, I walk in with my unearned privilege, so I'm not gonna hear the same story. I'm not gonna ask the same questions. And I'm probably not the best person to report on that. Yeah, it's interesting you should say that because uh, I just was on a webinar today about, you know, I don't, what do I say? I don't know what to do type of leadership. Um, in these times and the one of the things that was that we need to listen and we need to listen better and harder and deeper so it is it is something that i think is important so jeremy i want to ask you this question so how um considering first we have covid and now we have such racial tension um with the death of george floyd um and many before him um how are ethical behaviors and leadership being challenged with the racial tensions right now i know your school is about 40 percent of a diverse population so i know the kids aren't there but can you talk a little bit about that with the work you've done? Yeah, and I'll, I want to comment a little bit on the, the last question, too, and I can do these together. Um, I think it might be too soon to know who's really doing it well, uh, because we're still really in the thick of things. Um, but uh, I think a good indicator that we can all pay attention to, um, and, and some of it's tied to what Sherry just said, but it also, it also comes back to the question you just raised, Althea, is I would look to leaders and organizations who are not pretending to know it all, right? Um, as I talked about that identity work before, one of the reasons it's really important to know yourself is because you can't possibly know everybody else, right? If, if I'm advocating for uh, a young gay man as he's trying to come out to his parents, I have no idea what that feels like, right? That, that does not match anything in the realm of my experience, okay? As I'm counseling, um, a young black student who's been harassed as she walks through the neighborhood my school is in from her metro bus, right? I don't know the visceral feeling of what that's like uh, to be harassed because of the color of my skin. What I do know is that I've got enough experience behind me that I can stand with those kids and listen to what they say and let them know that it's not okay to be um, discriminated against or uh, loved less because of who they are and what they look like. So I'd say you got to look to you got to look to leaders and organizations who are willing to do that, not the ones who jump in first and say, "Here's the right way to do this. Here's our policy on this. We're right there with you." But the ones who take kind of a quieter approach, but are who who are consistently there in support of the communities who need them. Yeah. Um, so so that's the first step, and I think that gets to a little bit of your answer in terms of what what do you do. To go back to what Sherry, Sherry just said, um, a lot of it is just listening and knowing and, and letting your, your workers know, your employees know, you know the, the constituents you serve, letting them know that you are there for them. Even if you don't have an answer right away, the, the fact that you should be 
there and willing to listen to what they say and, and what they need and then try to help them get it, right? Um, the other thing I'm always wary of is people who are quick to make a lot of promises, right? We're gonna fix this right away. We're, that, I don't think that's very realistic, right? Life doesn't tend to work that way. Um, we should start taking steps to address these problems and fix them as quickly as, as we can. But I think there's a, a bit of lack of ethics and a bit of dishonesty in any scenario where it sounds like we're gonna have a quick fix, right? This needs to be addressed quickly but it also be it needs to be addressed intentionally over time, and that's really how we're going to fix these problems. Thank you. You know, we just um, issued a challenge to our leadership Buffalo community just about an hour ago, and um, I actually the idea was not mine. I I'm not creative, um, but it is one one of our black graduates who um, was very. Um, wanting to see something like this happen in her organization and it wasn't. So we put down a challenge asking all the partners in our community that we work with, companies, small businesses, nonprofits, educational institutions, to create a diversity and inclusion strategy, council, challenge, statement, um, initiative, and share it. So we can start to share because it, it one, to, we have to keep the conversation going. And two, there's people that are frozen because they don't know what to do. So giving them the ideas for them to be able to, um, to do those initiatives within their company, instead of just putting up a statement and say, oh, we're gonna be a diverse company. Well, how? You know, to really get people thinking about it and taking some action. So um, we do have another question in here. Um, one is, my team has been unpacking this article about what it means to be a rebel leader, and it has been powerful for us. The kind of leadership where you have the courage to say out loud, I really don't know how we go forward, but I know we can get there together and actually meet it. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. Another question from the audience is they appreciate um, the referrals that you shared, Jeremy, but does anybody have any um, suggestions on educational materials, workshops, classes, speakers to help continue to learn? And before I turn it to the group, I, we were just looking for this today because we did our diversity inclusion day yesterday. And we actually have a, um, the Community Foundation does racial, racial equity training. The partnership um, just um, launched, it's coming out in the fall, um, diversity training, diversity inclusion training classes. There is a fee for, I think, both of those. Um, but if any of you have any other uh, books, resources that you'd like to share. Uh, I'll start with two. Um, you know, as we talk about sort of the systemic nature of these problems, and I think that applies to both systemic racism, but it also applies to intentional systemic poverty and some structures that we have culturally that, that feed both of those things. Um, that's really surprising for a lot of people who are newer to this conversation or newer to this work um, and often hard to wrap their brains around in terms of like things have actually been set up to drive our culture in this way. So there's two resources that are really good that I would recommend. Uh, the first is um, the documentary from uh, 2016 uh, called 13th, and it talks about uh, the 13th Amendment, uh, and it defines um, how we moved from uh, an, inten an intentional slavery system in the United States to an intentional incarceration system, uh, and really never got to the freedom that we were intending to get to for our Black community. Um, the other which uh, goes along with that is there was a great series by NOVA years ago, and I don't remember the date off the top of my head, but it's called The Illusion of Race. And um, I think the second part of The Illusion of Race uh, spends a lot of time talking about redlining and uh, how intentional actions by the American government and the American financial system in post-World War II made it really hard for uh, black families and families of color to build wealth. Um, and they did that by controlling access to mortgage funding, essentially, so that uh, black people had a really hard time building up their communities and building wealth through owning a home. Uh, and we know that home ownership is also directly connected to educational access. So um, for decades, we've lived in a, in a society where those two things were intentionally controlled in such a way um, that communities of color have just not had the same opportunity to build personal wealth and to build consistent access to good education. Uh, and now we can see the results of that when we talk about things like uh, transportation deserts or food deserts or education deserts in the middle of gigantic urban communities that were redlined into poverty for decades and decades and decades. Um, so I'd say those two resources are really great. Um, 
sort of foundational resources for people to have an understanding of um, the fact that this has been here for a long time and it was intentionally built to look like it does. Um, that, that's the recommendations I'd make. Thank you. Anything from uh, Christy or Sherry? Uh, well, I, I would tell you that I'm a big fan of Bill Strickland, who um, started the nonprofit Manchester Bidwell Corporation, and then that's where Buffalo Center for Arts and Technology came from. I also look a lot at the, um, I mean, for issues on race, et cetera, and tools, I actually refer a lot to the New York City NYC Leadership Academy. And I think that um, there's a lot back and forth um, uh, that they do with actually the National Equity Project, which is what um, attendee Christina Lesh also posted. So those are three resources I use in, in that area. But I'd love to hear what Christy, well, Dr. Panagakis has to say. <laughs> oh, that's a lot of pressure when you say it that way. Um, Jeremy, it's funny that you mentioned that video series because just this morning at the United Way, we watched the first as a staff and then we did a discussion afterward. So I've only seen the first part of it, but it really was, you know, I work at an organization where we think about these things all the time and still it was a really significant, you know, meaningful conversation that we had with each other as a staff afterward. So just based on the little experience I've had, you know, I fully endorse that. The other thing I was going to recommend was a book that has gotten a lot of press in the last few years. It's called White Fragility, and it's written by Dr. Robin DiAngelo. I have, though, in the past week, so I wait, I should back up, that it's really aimed at white people in particular to be thinking about why are they so uncomfortable? And I shouldn't say they, I should say we, I identify as a white person. Why are we so uncomfortable? about issues surrounding race. You know, why, why is it so hard for white people to acknowledge that we live in a society that privileges certain groups over others? And so I have really liked it as it's a really a good like first step. You know, it, it, the book pushes you to think about things that are uncomfortable, but things that are necessary. I will note though that in the last few weeks, I've started to read, read some pushback from some writers of color that suggest that while the book does have use, it's going to center the feelings of white people over the needs of people of color. And so I do want to make that note that I personally found it very useful, you know, in my own journey in thinking about these issues, but I would be remiss if I didn't give voice to that point that it is helpful, but who does it put at the center? Who does it prioritize? So I, I think it's worthwhile, but I certainly wouldn't say that's the only thing that would be useful. I've actually just ordered that book and I, it's not, it's on back order. I think there's a lot of people ordering that book right now. So yeah. you know, one of the things that just to close, one of the things I learned, um, we had our diversity inclusion day yesterday that um, they were talking about white privilege. And we had a, a session on that and Jeremy wasn't able to join us, but we did have somebody talk with us and he's, I never thought I had white privilege because I didn't grow up rich. So I grew up, you know, and I figured it all out and I had to do everything myself, but I had white privilege because I have white skin. So my friend who was a black person who actually had to fight for the same things, they, had, they were always a step back because of the fact that no one ever has um, denied me because of the color of my skin. I'm like, oh, wow, I never thought of it that way. And I think all the things that, you know, so take it back to the ethics to end this. Um, you know, when you think about the populations of the Alice population and the, the, the racial, pop, you know, the, the diverse populations that we have in our organizations and companies, there's a lot of things that we don't know about them that we maybe are starting to find out now that Cherry mentioned. And as leaders, um, we have to think about that when we're asking people to come back to work, when we're asking them um, to, to be challenged. So what we're, what we're thinking of doing as leaders, we have to think about what are we asking them for and be conscious of that. And just to make sure that we're thinking all these things through um, and taking the information that we're learning about our employees and making sure that we're using that appropriately, wisely, legally, and ethically. So. Um, I really appreciate all this information that you guys shared today. You were probably all wondering how we were going to pull this into together, but um, it, you guys did a great job. So I love the work you're doing. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Thanks to the audience. Just to give you a heads up, our next um, week, um, we're, we're going to stay on the time to lead us now. So the next week we have Patrick Kaler. He's going to be talking about the tourism industry. As you know, got hit very, very hard all over the country, world. And um, a lot of our minority population and Alice population work in that, those spaces. So it's important to hear um, the direction that he thinks that that industry will be taking. He's a very positive person. Um, the week after that, we have Dottie Gallagher talking about the um, economy, our, you know, the Western economy.
but also they have just developed a diversity and inclusion. So we're gonna be able to have that conversation as well. We're gonna take a pause for a week after that. And then from there, we're gonna start, we're changing our town halls into, um, um, I keep forgetting the name of it, Jenna. I can't, we just created it today. Do, can you give me that? Thank you. Conversations. What are they? Connect, connecting conversations. Connect conversations? Connecting. Thank you. Connecting conversations and really having those uncomfortable but necessary conversations to get us to continue to talk. So with our, our Black leaders, our Black mothers, our Black educators, our law enforcement, um, really bringing those folks to the table and having those conversations so we can make sure that we keep this conversation going. So um, hopefully you can join us. But thank you again to our three presenters, Sherry, Jeremy, and Christy. I'm glad I don't have to say your last name again. And you all stay safe and well and good luck with your graduation around, Jeremy. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. Lost Melissa. <laughs> Who's this on the phone? Do we know? Oh, there we go. Okay. She's getting back on. There she is. There she is. Um, that was good. At first, I'm thinking, how are we going to bring this together? But it worked. Mm -hmm. it how was your training, Kate? It was good. Um, she did a good job, so I think that they got a lot out of it. Good, good. She sent me a text, but I haven't had a chance to, or email. Um, where's Hendrix? You're on mute, Jenna. What do you look, what are you getting? Chiggers? <laughs> He's a little chigger. Oh my gosh. Oh. Like, what I, sprayed, I sprayed this whole entire, I sprayed the table, the concrete, this chair with, with insect spray. Because are, yesterday... I, I, cause I was outside all day. I had like bites right here. Oh no. A bunch of little like red bites. So I took Benadryl and when I woke up this morning, they were gone. But I'm like, these little triggers. <laughs> That's great. Cool. All right. Well, that was good. How, so the training was good. That was good. Didn't have too many people on there, but it's okay. It didn't cost us any money, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, there's something I really wanted to talk to you about. That's why I said to come back on, but now I can't remember what it was. So Jenna and I tomorrow, I believe, uh, Jenna's for sure, if I get out of my haircut, I gotta get out of this chair. We're going to their, ment there's a protest mental health. Um, is it workers or? Um, it's mental health workers and social workers. Um, it's not a protest, it's a peaceful march. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah. Okay, Do you have yeah, a sign? The next education one will, like teachers or whatever, will be going mm -hmm. to that one. Let me get that thing, hold on. Cool. Okay, what'd she say? That she's gonna get the flyer. For this one tomorrow? Uh, I don't know if it's tomorrow. Maybe oh. it is. The education? Oh. Yeah. Thirtieth. When is it? Thirtieth. I bet Tim will go with us. That's a Tuesday. I can't. I gotta go. When is it, Jenna? The Tuesday, the thirtieth. June thirtieth. Is the next education one? Yeah. Cool. On it. Bring Cassidy. Do you have a? Do you have a flyer? Yes. It's Can you take a picture? of that and email or text it to me? Yes. Um, and is it in front of City Hall, Niagara Square? Yes. Okay. Have you seen people saying how, um, uh, hold on. I just want to tell you about Francesca when you're done. Donate to Black Lives Matter. <laughs> you're donating to Act Blue, which goes to Bernie Sanders. Like, <laughs> what? What? Huh? Social media.
What? What's going on? Oh, speaking of that, there. So there was an Oprah special which I totally missed. It was on. It aired Wednesday and yesterday, two night yeah. special, and it was um, it was conversations with um, serious conversation with Oprah, and the title was um, "Where Do We Go From Here?" And it had mm. it had like Keisha Lance Bottoms, like a whole bunch of like black educational leaders around the country and she was like in like interviewing them and i missed it you can probably google it i bet, I bet yeah, it's, it's gotta be somewhere. it's good they have to air it again they have to i feel like they do or it'll be like a something yeah so i wanted to tell you my my francesca story so i entered the phone because it didn't look like a strange number mm -hmm. It was like a cell phone you could tell so i answered it and i was on the webinar on the leaders you know the that thing mm -hmm. i couldn't figure out how to turn the volume it wouldn't turn down so i walked away and then she could still hear so i finally got off that she and she doesn't get she goes now what is that meeting again and i said well it's not a meeting it's a town hall and she said who are the speakers she goes well they're all white i said francesca these are the still on the diamond lead is now. I said, then we're going to pivot in July and moving into the new conversation. Oh my gosh. She doesn't get it. And then she had to give me a whole list of, well, this black person's a good one. And this black person's a great leader and this person and on and on. I said, okay, well, what we're trying to do is get real stories, not people just presenting. Yeah. We want to get, you know, three mothers that have black teenage boys, right? We want to get, you know, three um, educators who either teach, um, they are black like Derek, or they teach in a diverse population school and what their kids are going through. We should um, definitely have Derek. Yeah, yeah. That Easy. made me think of, that made me think of something for when we go into the conversations and involve law enforcement and Tom Dina. Remember the Buffalo um, Lieutenant? What was it? Not Ronaldo, the other guy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that's what I was thinking too. And yeah. then she's giving me all these cops and I'm like, well, we, you know, we do this. Like you have, you graduated in 99. Like we, mm -hmm. and I said, you know, she goes something about, well, she goes, you know, then she said she got kicked off the board because oh. she was diverse. So we should also talk about was diversity. Yeah, and I said, what year was that? She said, she couldn't remember. But it's I- and we, not why she got kicked off. It's probably because she <laughs> So then she, I said, did you register for the town hall today? She said, oh. I said, well, you, I just click on the link and you'll register. She yeah. wasn't on there. I know she wasn't on there because if she was on there, she would have been asking questions. You sure would have. Yeah, for sure. She's probably getting on now. It's 10 after 5. So then, yeah, then she's going on and on. And I kept trying to explain to her. And then I said, well, we have a, a much more people of diverse of color in our class this year. She goes, yeah, well, you don't have, you, don't, you do have black people, but you don't have people i said oh, so i said no 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 hold on i said hold on i said we don't have just the black person that works at mt bank we've got somebody who's a community action organization somebody's at buffalo urban league i embellish law i said somebody yeah. who runs the fruit belt land trust i said mm -hmm. no i said we have plenty well do they speak up i said uh-huh they speak mm -hmm. up and they speak up good. like they were like fake black people I know. <laughs> so when you're like a black person who like has a corporate job and lives in Clarence, they're not black. black. <laughs> oh, I'd love for her to say that to their face, like Rashida. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. What? No, Rashida. She works at Kaleida. So what is she calling herself? The only reason the woman still has a job and has anything in this community is, is because of her father, who was a wonderful, wonderful man, Frank Messiah. I'm saying, like, if she's claiming he's. that, oh, if you have a corporate job, hello, then what are you? The only reason the woman is anything in this community and hasn't gotten her ass kicked out of Kaleida is because of who her father was. So, but it was very interesting. But she didn't show up. She didn't come on. Like always Stuart, Stuart Angered is trying to tell me, this is good, you'll love this one. I ask people for their diversity initiative, challenge, statement, um, counsel. He sends me this email that says, I'm going to read it to you. Telling me how much the, the, uh, uh, health, the Community Health Foundation or the Independent Health Foundation are um, off 
Our deeds speak to the words. As you know, I chair the Independent Health Foundation. Since COVID, we provided services for 330,000 community members, majority who fall within the cohort of marginalized and disenfranchised. Our programs continue to save lives. We've aligned with COVID, the Community Response Fund. I wrote a large four page single space report for the IHA board listing our continuing outreach. We collected, donated, distributed 4,000, um, two tons of food through feed more thousands. Of what does that have to do with diversity council? Anything? Yeah, no, definitely not. And I, and I said that to him, I said, this is really great work. I said, but um, we're really looking for people who have created diversity inclusion initiatives well, all these, everything we do, I'm like, you're not getting this, man. And it's not, it's just, you know, like we do shit all the time. We help CDC, we help this, we that, that. But that's not a council. That's not a statement. That's mm -hmm. not a, an initiative. Ooh. I said, well, do you have anything like that? Does Infant Health Foundation have a diversity council? No. No, then he answers me back. I, I just give up and I'm turning my computer off, so. Diversity and inclusion <laughs> is what we are, so. <laughs> right? <laughs> Hello, handsome man. Well, I had to turn off my camera because he started eating nuts. Oh, good. <laughs> Where was the mud in the plants? Yeah, that was that uh -huh. was the face he was making. Yeah. Was like, You're silly. You're getting fuzzy hair there, Bubba. Yeah, I see little stick ups. Yeah, he's uh -huh. fuzzy. Can I get a little better look at you, please? Because you're not giving me. I don't want to look. Hi. Hi. Oh, you're going to do your, your crosswords? Okay, get the pencil. Mm -hmm. I know all the words. I'm very smart. What you got there, bubs? That's so I'm very busy. Look at your hair. You're so funny. You can. Where's your head? Head, head, shoulders, knees, and toes. Knees and toes. Head, shoulders, knees, and toes. <laughs> You got a daycare today. Head, shoulders, knees, and toes. Knees and toes. Head, shoulders, knees, and toes. Knees and toes. No? I'm just entertaining you. Uh -huh. Okay, so one more thing, Jenna. I would like a new headshot taken from you with my new teeth. When we get back. Oh, so good. What? What do you have is so good. Yeah, but I like my teeth better. Can you take these teeth and put them in the picture? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, you're good. You're good. Let's see. Let's test your graphic skills, Jenna. I know, right? right? <laughs> I, mean, I could probably whiten them, but. No, it's not whiten them. There's like a stick out thing. So if oh, you have that option, that'd be great for me. <laughs> oh, wait. Okay. So hold up. Hold on, wait. Hold up. Hold a copy. So I'm going to white them out. No, no, I guess it looks fine. Oh my God, you guys. I was looking at a picture on, popped up on Facebook, my um, um, memories from six years ago. Holy fuck, was I fat. <laughs> it was, it was, I was huge in the gut. It was, I was 20 pounds heavier. What's oh, the? Oh, you, it's gone. What's the? What? What's the matter? What are we doing? What are we doing? Hendrix, where's the truck? Where's the dog, Hendrix? Dog, oh, where's the dog? You don't feel like chatting with Grams today. Okay. All right. Well, you, my wine is calling my name, so. See you later, apricots. I'm going to go. I can't turn my patio. I'll be blown into Lake Erie. It's, well, maybe it calmed down a little. Is it windy over at your house, Melissa? Yes. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. Well, have a good night. I'm making cod for dinner. See you later. Oh, okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.